evening and welcome to CCP-TV, Community College of Philadelphia's Emmy-nominated educational channel. I'm your host, Kirsten Quinn, and this is the Philadelphia Cultural Forum. Our special episode tonight centers around the incredible organization developed by Baba Ahmad Kenya, Images of the Motherland. Their last appearance on the Philadelphia Cultural Forum garnered a Telly Award for their authentic portrayal of African and African-American heroes. Tonight, the group focuses on historical reenactments of amazingly fearless Africans and African-Americans in a program entitled Freedom. Tonight, we have three extraordinary actors playing equally extraordinary characters. Bilali Mohammed, Almani of Sapelo Island, Georgia, portrayed by Malcolm Clark, Sojourner Truth, Forgotten Roots, portrayed by Jasmine Morrison, and The Life and Times of Omar Ibn Said, portrayed by Baba Kenya. We also have a wonderful visual artist with us, Keisha D. Watley, who will present her exhibit, Women of Inspiration. One of my favorite parts of this show is that I will have the honor of interviewing the actors in character. And this is a phenomenal opportunity for audiences to see the authenticity of these important historical figures. Images is literally bringing these characters to life right before your eyes. United States fought the American Revolutionary War against England and won its freedom in 1776. I was six years old at the time. Then, 36 years later, the United States would find itself at war again with England. I was 42 years old then. It was the War of 1812. The English invaded the United States on many fronts and announced they would give freedom to any slave that deserted their slave master and joined the English army in the fight against the Americans. There were only two plantations on Sapelo Island, one of which was owned by Thomas Spaulding. Some of the slaves decided to take up the English offer for freedom. I announced to the slaves that I, and my family experienced slavery under the English in the Caribbean. And that slavery was far worse than what we had here on the Spalding Plantation. You see these here? You see these here? Some of y'all don't even know what these here are. These are the shackles of slavery. God have mercy on the ones who was run down, beat down, forced and whipped to wear these here shackles of slavery. I was never forced to wear these here shackles of slavery because I was born a slave. I was born in the North. Bet y'all didn't know that, huh? Did you ever hear tell of slavery in the North? <laughs> they had to put these chains and shackles on me because when I was with a child, <laughs> these chains and shackles was already on my mind. But when I grew up, those same chains and shackles began to weaken because I yearned for the day I'd be free. I yearned for the day my mamas and my papa be free. I yearned for the day my sisters and my brothers be free. I yearned for the day my children and grandchildren be free. I yearned for the day that all the Negroes of the United States of America be free. Over 34,000 black men died in the U.S. Civil War fighting for your freedom. But some of y'all still continues to put on these here shackles of slavery every single day. Jamaica! Freedom! Jamaica! Freedom! Jamaica! Freedom! In the year of 1782, when I was captured in my homeland and taken away from my country, never to see my family, my friends, my loved ones ever again in life, I was 12 years old. Yes, I was only 12 years old. And, and I would relive this nightmare 
for the rest of my life. In Namco, Bilali Muhammad. My name is Bilali Muhammad. I was given this name by my father. It was the name of the Muslim world's first Mu'adhan who called the Muslim people to prayer. He was an African companion to the Prophet Muhammad. May God grant him mercy and give him peace. His name was Bilal ibn Rabah. Allah yatama. Ingumi Miko Timbo Futajalon. My birthplace was in a village called Timbo in the land of Futajalon. This was a village near Senegal River in West Africa. I was born in the year 1770, and I died in the year 1857, when I was 87 years old. Futajalom was in that place you know today as the Republic of Guinea in West Africa. Timbo was the village with the great al Mami named Ibrahim Sori Maldo lived. He was called Sori the Great. Futajalom was one of the fuller states of that time. Fugumba, it was the religious capital, but Timbo, it was the political capital. There was a great big cone-shaped mosque built in Fugumba. I sought knowledge and instruction from a great marable. I studied in Quranic schools. I learned many things. I even learned to read, speak, and write in Arabic and Pular languages. I was dedicated to my studies. I greet you today in the pool language of my ancestors, Om Bali Jam, Om Bali Jam. Om Bali Jam in the pool language means good morning. To live in Africa, you must learn to speak many languages because you to learn order to understand the many people who live there. I too learn to read, speak, and write in many languages. Then, one fateful day, I was captured and kidnapped by slavers. No, 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 no. I was now in that part of the transatlantic slave trade known as the Middle Passage. This was a triangle-shaped slavery trading route by sea that brought raw materials from the Caribbean to Europe, where manufactured goods were taken to Africa and traded for captive Africans who were then sent to the Caribbean and forced to work the plantations. Almost two million Africans died in the Middle Passage. Those countries that benefited from slavery were America, Brandenburg, Brazil, Denmark, England, France, Netherlands, Portugal, Spain, and Sweden. I will never let the Tubabu take my name, my heritage, my religion from me. In 1803, when I was 33 years old, Allah Yatama, something happened. A Tubabu man by the name of Thomas Spalding purchased me and my complete family and brought us to a plantation on Sapilo Island in the state of Georgia in the United States. This Tubabu man, Thomas Spalding, wasn't anything like the other Tubabu slave masters.
Thomas Spaulding assigned me as head man over more than 500 slaves, out of which 80 of them were Muslims. I became their al mami or imam, just like back home in Futa Jalon. I would lead them in the five daily prayers, barefooted facing east towards Mecca, teach them about their religion, and even organize celebrating our two Muslim holidays. We built a mosque on the plantation. I even taught them to read and write in Arabic and Pular languages. We would write words and messages in the sand on the beaches, but those that didn't understand, they just paid it no mind and called it chicken scratch. In the War of 1812, the United States would fight the American Revolutionary War against England and win its freedom in 1776. The English invaded the Americans on many fronts and announced they would give freedom to any slave that deserted their slave masters and joined the English army in the fight against the Americans. There were two plantations on Sapelo Island, one of which was owned by Thomas Spaulding. Some of the slaves decided to take up the English offer for freedom. I announced to the slaves that I and my family experienced slavery under the English in the Caribbean, and that slavery was far worse than what we had here on the Spalding plantation. I met with Thomas Spaulding, and I told him to give me and the 80 Muslims rifles to defend the plantation and their property from attacks. This would be the only documented history of a slave master giving his slaves weapons. Thomas Spaulding issued the rifles to the 80 Muslims, and I made him the promise. I personally who answer for each of these Muslims, but I cannot be responsible for the actions of the Christians that you own. When the English heard about the armed Muslims, they decided not to attack, and they lost the War of 1812 three years later in 1815. The 18-page book that I wrote would be placed on display in the Georgia State Library in Atlanta. I was one of the few documented Africans to write a document while held in captivity in America. Indamco. Omar bin Said. My name is Omar bin Said. That means I am Umar, the son of Said. I was born in the year 1770, and I died in the year 1863. I was 96 years old. Ingumi, Miko, Futatoro. My birthplace was a land called Futatoro. And I was born in the year 1770 on the banks of the Senegal River in Africa. In the year 1788, when I was 18 years old, the great Almami of Futatoro, that is the ruler of Futatoro, his name was Abdul Kader Kani. 
and he should have need it, prohibiting the slave trade in Futatoro. But then, one dark day, the alarm was sounded. But alas, it was sounded far too late. A large army attacked my village, killing most of the men and taking me captive. They took me and they forced me down to the banks of the Senegal River and then to the coast of the Great Sea where they sold me into the hands of the Tubabo. It was the Tubabo who took us and bound us together, two by two, who could only speak the same language. See, for one month and a half, until we came to that place they called Charlestown in the Christian language. That is a place in the South Carolina. I remember it well. It was the year 1807. I was 37 years old. And I was among the last group of Africans brought into America from the trans-Atlantic slave trade. Oh, my father, my father, what shall I do, my father, my father? Jamag! Freedom! My father, my father, what shall I do, my father? Jamag! Outside of the city of Fayetteville, North Carolina, I saw some great houses. I do not know what they were, but as I watched and I waited, I noticed the people. They would go inside, they would kneel down, and they would pray. I thought to myself, this must be some kind of holy place or sanctuary, like a mosque, a place where Everyone is safe and free from harm. I decided to watch and to wait until the new moon. And then I decided to go into the church to seek sanctuary. A young Tubabo boy saw me go inside of the church and he rode off on horseback to the place where his father was to warn him that he had just seen a black man enter into the church. A man named Hunter, 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 Hunter came along with another man on horseback riding with a large troop of barking and growling dogs and they had killing sticks, the long one and the short one. Like this, I still remember the devastation and the destruction of the killing stick from my homeland in Futatoro. When I was five years old, I saw my father murdered. I could still smell the seared burning flesh from his open wound 
caused by the hot projectile shot from the killing stick into his body. I could still hear his agonizing cries as he lay slowly dying. I could still hear, hear, hear the wails. wails and the moans of my family members who could do absolutely nothing. Nothing! <laughs> to help save his life. I could still hear the terrible thunderous roar killing stick, and I made a decision not to become another victim of the killing stick. I was born in the year, the best I can recollect, 1797. At least that's what they told me. I was born in slavery in a place called Swinton New York in Ulster County. This place was about 90 miles from New York City. My papa, he was from Africa, in a place called Ghana. And my mama, she was from Africa too, in a place called Fujilon. <laughs> there was 12 of us here cheering, and we called our mama, Mama Beth. <laughs> and we called our papa James. And because we were slaves owned by the Bonfrey family, we called our mama Elizabeth Bonfrey, and we called our papa James Bonfrey, and they calls me Isabella, Isabella Bonfrey. But you know, why folks sure do got a way of shortening people's names. So they finally called me Belle. The Bonfrey family was from a place in Europe called Holland. And in this place, they spoke Dutch. And that's the language I learned how to speak when I was a child. I also remember a couple of African words my papa would say to me every time he would see me. He would say, me baba, which means my daughter. And my mama would say, me bingi line depot. When I was nine years old, in the year 1806, my slave master, Charles, Hardenberg died. My family, my mom and my papa, we were all sold off in many different directions. And I was sold with a flock of sheep for $100. I was sold to a cruel and violent man named John Neely. <laughs> that dim had a nerve to rape and beat me daily when I was a child. No, stop, please, and no. to protect me. And no one to tell. Mom, mom, please. Mom, please help me, please. The only relief I got is when I was sold off to two masters in the next two years that followed. I was finally sold to a man named John Dumont who lived in West Park, New York. And in this place I learned to speak the English language for the first time. In the year 1815, I was 18 years old. And I fancied a young buck by a nearby farm named Roberts. <laughs> and Roberts, he fancied me too. We fell in love with one another. <laughs> Roberts and me, we had a baby girl, and her name was Diana. <laughs> Roberts' slave master, <laughs> he ain't favored the idea of me and Roberts being together, because our baby girl Diana and any other children me and Roberts had would all become the property of John Dumont. Roberts' slave master, 
He forbade us from being together. But my robbers came to see me anyway. <gasps> Robert Slave Master and his son found my robbers and beat them like savages. Until my slave master, John Dumas, stopped them. I never heard from robbers again. from those injuries he got when they beat him. On June 1st, 1843, I was 45 years old, and I changed my name. I changed my name to Soldier of the Truth. I heard the call of God who gave me a mission to be a sojourner. A sojourner, a sojourner for truth. Created by Baba Kenya, images of the motherland went through a metamorphosis from doing African theater based upon their own original drama productions on authenticated African history. In 2009, the current transition to historical figures, Forgotten Roots, with a direct link to African American history and American history was forged. They are the link or bridge between Africa and African Americans. Their characters tell of their life experiences in Africa prior to enslavement, and their autobiographies and interviews are what these presentations are based upon. Ahmad Kenya writes the scripts for these narratives. Let's now talk to Bilali Muhammad and Omar Ibn Said. Omar, can you tell us about what you're writing? Yes. Um, the first uh, piece that I was writing here is on uh, something we call loha. Mm. Uh, loha actually means the wood, the prayer board that uh, we use in uh, Western North Africa to write uh, things like the Quran and uh, studies for school mm -hmm. uh, on. Uh, this particular uh, loha has uh, the writing of uh, the opening chapter of the Quran, we call it uh, Surah Fatiha. Mm -hmm. Fatiha in Arabic means opening, mm -hmm. like a key. And uh, this is uh, actual the, the seven verses that uh, uh, compose uh, what's called Surah Fatiha, or the opening chapter of the Quran. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's what uh, this is. Um, the other piece that... Uh, I, I was writing here is actually part of my autobiography, uh, which tells the story of my life, which mm. was uh, the, some of the excerpts we, we did here, we performed here today for the viewers to see. So this is my actual handwriting uh, sample from uh, my um, autobiography, which was written here in, in America. And you are one of the only autobiographers from that time period to be recognized? Well, actually, uh, this is the only one that is written in the Arabic language. In the Arabic language. Yes, in America. Uh, this, is, uh, uh, this was written in about uh, 1821. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, this is the only documented autobiography in the Arabic language. So this makes it, um, how you say, uh, American literature, mm -hmm. even though it's written in Arabic. Mm -hmm. And so this is one of the first examples of Islamic writing written in the United States. Uh, one of the first, yes. Mm -hmm. But there were uh, numerous others uh, before my time. Okay. I believe the earliest one was probably Cherno, who uh, wrote uh, Surah Fatiha. Mm -hmm. Also, this same uh, chapter here of Quran, uh, just before the United States uh, gained its independence. Mm -hmm. Wow, this is absolutely beautiful. So what made you want to tell your story and write it down? What was the, what, what was the significance of that for you, and how did that come about? Well, you know, I was a teacher in Futa Jalon. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, Futa Toro. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm thinking of my friend here, <laughs> Bilali Muhammad from yes. Futa Jalon. Yes. 
uh, I was a teacher in Futatoro uh, for uh, about uh, 15 years. And so uh, all of the emphasis uh, in, in our culture has to do with uh, education and literacy. Yes. Education and literacy is extremely important. So uh, things are written down. Mm -hmm. People have to learn the languages. They have to learn how to write. Uh, mm -hmm. They memorize large volumes or texts of materials. Right. Uh, I didn't memorize the complete Quran, but I memorized enough of it to write large uh, volumes of it. Wow. Uh, Bilali, in turn, memorized this book. Mm. Uh, which was something that was very profound because there are two primary resources that uh, Muslims study in uh, North and West Africa. The first one being the Quran. They learn right. to memorize and write the Quran. But <clears throat> they also learn to memorize, as this man did, uh, something which is called, uh, by its proper name, Al-Risala, mm. and Al-Risala in Arabic means the message. Yes. This uh, book is over a thousand years old, and uh, I'm going to show you some of the pages here, Please as do. you can see. Now, the actual text of the book is the larger, darker font type okay. that we see here. Mm -hmm. And everything you see on the side mm -hmm. is glossing. Okay. The glossing is from students who have studied these particular pages and written their notes, their notes in the yeah. side. So they're like annotations. Yes, these are like annotations, and they go throughout the whole book. Uh, this book was memorized by Bilali uh, up until the point when he was 12 years old, when he was first captured. My goodness. So he memorized what this book. What a memory. Book, <laughs> and, and he wrote it here in America. OK, great. Yes. Now, I'll show you something uh, very briefly here. This is a sample page here of uh, Al Risala, mm -hmm. and without the glossing. We've, we chose a page without the glossing. And this is the actual translation of what it says there. Right. So I don't know if you can read that. Mm -hmm. So this is a page from the section on ablutions, which is the cleansing, uh, cleansing the body in preparation for prayer. And this instruction is regarding the procedure for cleaning the feet. And the English language translation concerning with regard to as for wiping. Then he washes his feet. He pours water with his right hand on his right foot. And he rubs it with his left hand a little by little, encompassing it, repeating, cleansing it by that three times. If he wishes, he can pass his fingers in that through the toes. And if he leaves that out, there is no problem. Passing the fingers through the toes is preferred or is better for one's soul. And he rubs. That's incredible. And so this translation, if we look at the top of the, the, the book, the Al-Risala, 922, between 922 and 996, Yes, that's when uh, the uh, the actual author, mm -hmm. uh, Imam Zaid al Karawani, mm -hmm. lived. Uh, he was in uh, Karawan, Tunisia, mm -hmm. uh, which was about 1,500 miles across the Sahara Desert from Timbuktu. Okay. And then, if you go to another 200 miles south, you come to a place called Gao. Okay. And that's where we got our copy of, oh, look at the dust coming from Mali. Oh, with a thousand-year-old text, <laughs> the, the, I imagine. The, the that dust from sense. Gao is coming out. Uh, yes, about 200 miles south of uh, Timbuktu. Wow. That is phenomenal. So I wanted to ask a couple of questions of, of you, um, Bilali. Yes. I wanted uh, to find out a little bit from you about that Middle Passage and what it was like on that slave ship. Wow. As I recall, in 1782, when I was captured, mm -hmm. they placed me on a large ship, shackled and chained mm -hmm. with a small group of other children who had also been captured and sold, as well as many other African men and women. Yeah. Some of them were bleeding from wounds they suffered from their, attacks or their attackers. Uh, we were all cramped below, beside each other on the slave ship. We even had to lay and sit in our own urine and feces. Oh. It was a very tough experience. I even had a 
the young boy I was chained to, he died. Oh my God. Yes, yes. And what a, what a long journey. And the fact that so many people passed away on that journey. It's, I think, hard for contemporary people to imagine what that must have been like and how traumatic that must have been for you. Tell me a little bit about your family. Oh, my, my family. Uh, I had a very big family. I met my wife on these sugarcane plantations in Bahama Islands. Okay. Her name was Phoebe. Uh, <laughs> together, we had 19 children, 17. We had 12 sons and seven daughters. Oh my goodness, yes, my these goodness. are good memories. Yes, these are, these <laughs> are great memories, you see too. the smile on my face. Yes, uh, I do. Yes, my daughters, their names were Binti, Charlotte, Fatima, Hester, Medina, and Yoruba. No. Yes, my uh, smallest daughter, my youngest daughter, Binti, mm -hmm. um, she was the only one that uh, could speak the language yet, but uh, every all of my other daughters, they were able to speak uh, English, French, Arabic, and Pular. You forgot Hester. And Hester, Hester. Hester will be angry with you if you don't mention her. <laughs> Hester, Hester will, will be okay. <laughs> yeah. I was like, Hester, Hester, I love Hester very much. Oh, yes. that's so wonderful. And what else can you tell us um, about your journey, um, about your experience here in the United States? If you had one memory that you'd like to share with us, what would that be? That's a tough question, I imagine, for, um, for you, Omar. Well, uh, the main thing I would like uh, to convey to your audiences is uh, to, uh, to follow through with uh, their education, yes. uh, especially with regard to their literary education. Understand, in your time period, all the children are, are attached, they're obsessed with uh, these video things. Yes, uh, they are. That very few of them read, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, that makes it very difficult because um, they, don't, uh, they don't elevate themselves uh, throughout life by learning to read and to study things. Yeah. So uh, literacy is extremely important, you know. Uh, case in point, uh, 1810 uh, United States Census in North Carolina, where I was, uh, indicated that only uh, half of the population of uh, white American males could read and write at that time. And uh, less than that among the females could read and write their names. You know, Bilali was in, uh, he, he was 12 years old. He was uh, reading and writing reading. three, four, five different languages. Right. You know, myself also. Yes. And people have a tendency to think of it as strange that uh, people speak so many different languages, but it's common, you know. Yes. You have to be able to communicate with anyone and everyone that you encounter in life. So. And look at the high level of literacy that you brought to this country. It's incredible. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to show before we um, move forward a couple of portraits. Yes? Yes. Mm. This Isn't is that beautiful? Uh, this is from the original uh, portrait uh, photograph of, uh, of Umar Ibn Said. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, this is uh, the writing that he did from uh, when he was 90 years old, this one mm. at the top here. Uh, and it also has uh, his commentary in there also. So he was uh, retaining his faculties when he's 90, uh, writing from the Quran without seeing it, doing it from memory, and also writing his own uh, commentary. Oh, amazing. One last thing to show before we move. Yes, this is this is my artist's rendition of uh, Bilali Muhammad. Yeah. Yes, there as an are. old man. As an like old me. man. Like me. Yes, you see. And the costume, the authentic costume here, the the clothing, the fez. What a beautiful portrait. Thank you both so much. Thank you so much Thank for, you for being hosting here. us and bringing us here to your oh, audience. Oh, we are very lucky, very blessed to have you. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. We have two more guests with us this evening. One from history, Sojourner Truth, the great feminist and abolitionist. And then we also have a contemporary artist, the beautiful Keisha Watley, who's going to share some of her work with us tonight. And we're gonna to talk together about what it's like to be a woman mm -hmm. and also what it was like 
during your time period, having to deal with such horrible racial issues, things that still occur today, and being a woman on top of all of that. So thank you both so much for being here tonight. Thank you. Thanks, and I wanted to ask you a few questions about your history. Yes. Um, can you tell me a little bit about your family? I always like to start there. Absolutely. It's a so big family. I, yes, <laughs> I do have a big family. Um, so I have five children, mm -hmm. and, uh, and uh, my first, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, I have five children, and I love them very dearly. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, I lost one to being sold off um, and to someone in Alabama mm. um, after we were freed in New York. Um, so, you know, but it's a part of the life that we were living in back then. Yeah. And so much tragedy and so much pain that you went through. And yet what you did yes. for society after that, yes. you could have been broken down and torn apart, but somehow you rebuilt that and you, you created a movement. Mm. Um, one of the things I'd like to ask you a little bit about is uh, your work to eliminate segregation. And one of the, uh, the moments that you had had to do with the trolley cars yes. at the time. Can you explain Sure. What that was? So I was in, I went to Washington, D.C. and specifically rode on the streetcars in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. to fight against segregation mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. um, to stand up as, yeah. a, as a woman yeah. and to portray freedom yeah. for those that are still bound. Yeah. Um, that was the purpose of me doing it. And I won actually in court. Yeah. I was the first black woman to win a case wow. in the United States court. That is amazing. Yes. And we often think of Rosa Parks later exactly. in history. Yes. And so we have you paving the way. Yes. You know, as, as sort of a renegade, as exactly. an abolitionist, as someone who's ahead of her time. Exactly. One of the things that you talk about in your portrayal, and I can't even imagine how difficult that must be for you to talk about, is um, an assault that took place, several assaults that took place over, over the course of time when you were just a child. Yes. What is it that like for you to talk about that? It's difficult. Mm -hmm. It's freeing and difficult. Is it? Okay. It's freeing and liberating um, because the more I share, the more freedom I get from the trauma. Yeah. Because uh, it was very traumatic to oh, go yeah. through that at such a young age. Oh my God. Um, and to think now that I'm an adult, I can't even imagine how much how I bared it all. At a young age, I have no idea. So it was, it was, it's, it's heart wrenching. Yes, it is. Um, and for those that actually still go through it today, I can't even imagine. Yeah. The pain that they feel today. Yeah. I, I want to talk to Keisha mm. a little bit about that because in contemporary society, there is a movement right now, mm -hmm. the Me Too movement. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and that mo movement is about uh, women who have been sexually harassed and assaulted, mm -hmm. coming forward. How could you sort of compare Sojourner's story to, to what we experience, if you have any thoughts on that? Wow. Um, I have a lot of thoughts on it. Great, um, yeah. Um, but to condense them a bit, mm -hmm. I would say, um, I mean, just imagining the era that Sojourner lived in, mm -hmm. where the idea was or the environment was that this is just what happened. Mm -hmm. We belong to other people. We don't own ourselves. Mm -hmm. and keep quiet or you'll get yourself hurt or right. worse killed right um or your children sold away and so it was just a it was an accepted thing that just kind of happened mm -hmm. um marriages happened on plantations and wives were then raped and assaulted and hurt mm -hmm. and beaten and the husband's just powerless to do anything about it and yep. so it was kind of just what was right. and then to come to a place where Women are now empowered and and feel strong to stand together yeah. and say, you know what, we're not going to just uh, accept that this is what happens. This is just what is, yeah. and um, we're going to speak our truth of what happened and 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 name people who have hurt us and yeah. assaulted us. 
um, it really it really shows how far we've come, mm -hmm. and also how much further we need to go. Mm -hmm. Because that is beautiful. You said. get to see mm -hmm. like how often it happens. Mm -hmm. um, but it's great that women feel strong enough and empowered enough to say to say that it happened at all. Yeah, and I'm glad that coming from the past, a woman from the past, mm -hmm. is able to talk about this too. Mm -hmm. You know, and it shows us the history and how long, you know, and it's been going on since the beginning of time. Mm -hmm. But to show, again, how far we have to go, how mm -hmm. far we've come, but to also give you a voice for that. Mm -hmm. If you had one bit of advice that you would give the world today, mm -hmm. what do you think that would be? Speak out. Speak your truth. Mm -hmm. Sort of off of what Keisha was saying, just... Live your truth. Mm -hmm. Let it come out, because again, the more you speak it, the more freedom and healing comes. Yeah. It, may, it may be scary up front, mm -hmm. you know, and it still may be as traumatic as it was the day that it occurred. Mm -hmm. But the more you allow yourself to go through and live it, live through it, the more you heal. Yeah, mm -hmm. beautifully said. I want to show um, your artwork, Keisha. Um, which is absolutely Thank beautiful. Thank you. And this is a portrait of Sojourner. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Yes. Can you tell me just a little bit about this? Um, the, the title for the portrait is Sojourner and Her Troops. <laughs> um, and they're the black reg regiment uh, troops for, of her time. And um, you don't see Sojourner often with other black males. Right. Um, and uh, I met Baba Kenya, mm -hmm. especially, what a special moment, um, while sharing my Women of Inspiration portraits. Mm -hmm. And he asked me to create this piece, and I was especially honored. Um, I had a lot of feelings going through uh, creating it, mm -hmm. um, but it was wonderful to see an image of a powerful woman with male supporting her. Yeah. Um, so that was that was especially unique for me to create. Um, and it's my hope that people draw strength from it. Yes. That they see her story in it, that she was a woman that didn't just do speeches, she was also a woman of action. Yeah. Um, and that she was supported throughout history yeah. as well. Thank you both so much for Thank having you. me on the show, Thank for you. sharing all of the stories that you have. and and the portrayals with us and your artwork. Thank you. Um, we so appreciate it here on the Cultural Forum. Um, this is what we live for mm -hmm. on this show. Awesome. Amazing guests like yourselves and uh, our other two wonderful, amazing uh, men uh, from West Africa who have, have given us so much in terms of yeah. their history. Awesome. Um, thank you all. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Baba Kenya, Malcolm Clark, Jasmine Morrison, and Keisha D. Watley for being a part of this fascinating episode. We are so proud to have you as actors and characters on the show. If you would like to learn more about tonight's performances in this fabulous cast, please check out Images of the Motherland Interactive Theater online. The company provides study guides, performance arts, music, museum artifact exhibitions, and performances to its audiences. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm your host, Kirsten Quinn, and you have been watching the Philadelphia Cultural Forum on CCP-TV, Community College of Philadelphia's Emmy Award-nominated educational channel.